Amen. Open your Bible with me to the book of Ezekiel chapter 1. I want to teach you today how to have four faces. Uh-huh, four faces. I'm not talking about being two-faced, okay? How many know believers are not two-faced? Amen? Uh, there's a sense in which we present ourselves to the world when we present ourselves as one. We are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who we are at home is the same as who we are at the store. Who we are uh, at the restaurant is who the same person that we are at grandmother's house. I don't want to be four, two-faced, but I do want to have four faces, all right? And I know some of you are thinking, what has my pastor been smoking this week? All right, nothing, all right? Just open your Bible and I'll show you what I mean, okay? Uh, and so we're going to jump into the word, into the book of Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 10. And 11. When I want to ask you this question, a lot of people have, have thought about it. Many people have asked this question Are we alone in the universe? Is there life in other places? Is earth the only place where God created beings, or did the God of heaven create other beings out there somewhere else? Well, let me give you the biblical answer to that. There is life on other places, okay? Uh, God created a multitude of angels, right? He has also created what is known in Scripture as the four living creatures. And in the moment, we're going to look at and read about the four faces of those creatures in the book of Ezekiel. But just for your understanding, let me kind of uh, fill in the gaps here today. These beings are seen in the book of Revelation chapter 4. They're spoken of in Isaiah chapter 6. And although the descriptions vary uh, a little bit between each description in those books, the interesting thing about these four living creatures is that they're always found in the presence of God. And as such, they are reflections of the glory of God. How many of you realize that if you hang out with God, you're going to become like Him? Am I right? These beings are godly beings. They could not be in the presence of God without being, in a sense, like Him. They could not be in His presence for eons, we don't really know how long, without the presence of God somehow affecting them. So as the book of Ezekiel opens, all right, Ezekiel, just an ordinary priest, he either has a spiritual vision seeing these beings or these four living creatures are actually manifesting themselves on the earth. We're not really sure which one it is, but from a distance as Ezekiel views this, it seems like it's a whirlwind. They're coming out of the north, and as it grows closer and closer, Ezekiel is able to get a very good look of these beings. Now, I'm not going to read the entire description this morning. You can do that if you like today, or this afternoon when you get home, Ezekiel chapter 1. But essentially, it is a description of these four living creatures. And interestingly enough, uh, they seem to be touching the earth, and they seem to be carrying the very throne of God with God sitting upon it. And I mean, the description is very fantastical. It's like something out of a science fiction movie. I mean, wheels within wheels and eyes everywhere and, and wings and these four faces. And, and so we have to ask ourselves the question, why did Ezekiel have this vision? And the overarching, I believe, message of the vision that Ezekiel saw was that God, who is sitting upon his throne, knows what is going on on this earth. This is really a vision of heaven touching earth. How many of you know that God is not disengaged with the earth and what's going on in it? Come on. He did not just set the earth spinning and then leave it to its own devices. There's a God in heaven who controls everything under his sovereign plan. And Ezekiel, how many of you are with me? Ezekiel at the beginning of his calling, at the beginning of his ministry, needed to know and understand that there was a God in heaven that could touch the earth at any moment. 
God is ultimately in control. And how many of you know that some of us, as we live our lives on the planet Earth here today in 2019, we need to be reminded that God is still actively engaged in planet Earth. Come on. He's still real. He's still powerful. God is not far away. We, we, we don't have to have a vision as Ezekiel did. It would be amazing if we did. But we can be assured that the throne of heaven can touch earth at any moment. Come on, if you believe that God is in control, can I give you, can you give the Lord a hand of praise today? Amen. But what attracts my attention this morning is the fact that these four living creatures carrying the, this throne touch the earth and that the Bible describes them as having four different faces. Now, this is not a description of God, okay? It's a description of beings that reflect God and who He is. But let me read it for you today. Ezekiel 1 and verse number 10. It says this, As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Now, this image, these visions that Ezekiel had must have had a powerful impact on him. How many of you think so? It was the moment of his calling. It was a time when God was taking Ezekiel, an ordinary priest, and molding him and making him into what God wanted him to be. And as you continue to read about the calling of Ezekiel, you find this amazing verse in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse number 8. And what is happening is that God at that moment is dealing with Ezekiel about strengthening his face. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me he had a vision of these beings with four different faces and now God that's impacting him. And now God is dealing with Ezekiel about strengthening his face. You see, God knew that Ezekiel was coming up against some difficult people, some difficult situations, some strong-headed people who refused to listen to him. And so this is what God says to Ezekiel in chapter 3 and verse 8. He said, Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads. I wonder, is there anybody today who would say, I would like to have a strong face? Huh? Come on. In other words, and, and Ezekiel was, was a very powerful, strong prophet, right? He didn't back up. He didn't back down. He didn't get shy. He didn't get afraid. He didn't compromise the word in spite of being ridiculed, having different storms he went through, difficulties. God was with him, and it showed where? On his face. Now, I'm of the considered opinion that there is nothing in the word of God that doesn't have a meaning for you and for me, right? Uh, this is, book is not a dead, dusty, dry book about some old prophet whose bones have long since buried, about a vision that means nothing. No, sir. This book is living, active, and alive, and it means something for you and for me. And, and how interesting that the part of the vision uh, that, 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 and that God encountered that touched Ezekiel was that his face was to be changed. <laughs> And I tell you, I'm not expecting for us to grow six wings and become like the four living creatures. No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. Is it possible today that you and I need our faces strengthened in the society and culture that we live in? Have you ever come up against an enemy? Come on. Have you ever faced an obstacle? And let me just put it like this. Did you know that you can set your face the way you want it to be set? You can. I know some of y'all have done it. Jesus actually did it. He set his face as a flint, the Bible tells us. Uh, he, he, he fulfilled prophecy when he did that. And, and, and you, you've done it because you remember when you had that luncheon appointment that your boss made you go with that person at work that you really didn't want to hang out with, but you decided, I'm going to go. It's one hour long, so I'm going to set my face like this. And I'm going to be as nice as pie, and I'm going to be, it's going to be, I'm going to get through this because I've decided I'm going to set my face in a certain way. You've all set your faces in a certain way. Come on. And some of us have set our faces like, you remember when they double charge your credit card? You had a completely different face on that time. Hello. 
when you were talking to them in person and you went down there to get things straightened out. So what I'm saying is we can set our face. Even Jesus did it. And so let's look at that. It says here in Luke 9, 51, it says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face toward to go to Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and nothing is going to stop me. He was determined. His faith showed determination that he was going to go all the way to Jerusalem. And so I want to teach you today how to make your face strong, okay? All right? And, and, and because these faces have a powerful impact even for the believer, okay? So let's take a look at the four faces of a believer. The first face, number one, uh, is this. If you want to be a, have a strong countenance. If you want to have a strong face is number one, you've got to have the face of a man when you're coming before God. The face of a man when you're coming before God. How many of you know when we stand before God, we must come with the humble face of mankind? Ezekiel 1.10 says, As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Now, in order to have a strong countenance, the person has to really have the face of a man. And when I speak of the face of a man, I'm not talking about maleness here. I'm rather talking about humanity here. No matter what is happening around us, before us, in difficulties of life, the good news is this, that you and I have access to the God of heaven. Aren't you grateful? Amen. We have access to the very throne room of God. It's one of the great believers' benefits of being a believer. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what's going on around you. You might be in traffic. You may be home in bed. You may be experiencing difficulty, hardship ship, you may be stressed, you may be on the mountain or on the valley, but the good news is this, my friend, that you can set your face towards heaven. You can set your face to come before God. The psalmist said this, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from uh, the maker of heaven and earth. We are just put our eyes and put our face on heavenly things. And when we come before God, we have to come understand that we come before God as a man, as human beings. Now the good news is this, we come as redeemed human beings. Aren't you grateful? Come on, give Jesus a big hand of praise. Amen? We come as sons and daughters of God, but a human being nonetheless. So let's think about this for a moment. It is the finite coming before the infinite. It is the weak coming before the incredibly strong. It is the needy coming before the need maker. It is those of us who sometimes lose our way coming before the one who, who is the way and is the way maker. And the scripture describes man like this. He says in Psalms 8 and verse 4, he says, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? The Bible actually describes describes your life and my life like a vapor that soon vanishes. It's a mist. Our days are short in length, almost like dust in the wind. As we compare ourselves and our lives to the greatness of God and to all of eternity, it just seems like we are incredibly small. And so when we come before God, the first thing that we have to come with is a sense of humility. Now, not in a sense of shame, because how many of you know that if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, you have no shame? Amen? Not in the sense of unworthiness, no, because we've exchanged our faith, and He's given us His righteousness. He's the one that makes us worthy. Come on, give Him praise today. Not in the sense of being a stranger, not in the sense of being a beggar, because we're no longer excluded from the household of faith, but rather we're partners with Him, we're part of the household of faith. We come as blood-washed sons and daughters. We come boldly. We come with faith. But we also have to come with humility. You know why? Because we're not talking to the big Santa Claus up in the sky. Hello. We're not talking to the man upstairs. We're talking to the one true God, the creator, the everlasting one. He's the one that we honor, that one that we fear even with godly reverence. And I'll have you know that it is a miracle of heaven that that God of heaven actually heeds our voice, actually listens to us, actually cares about what's going on in our lives. 
us. It's incredible that he listens to us. Uh, but the face of God has to face, as we face God, our face has to be the face of humility. Because he's God and I'm not. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than mine. Uh, his wisdom, he, he, he has wisdom I don't have. I, I'm just trying to figure out the middle part and he already knows the end. Come on somebody. He knows everything that there is to know. And so when we come before him, not only do we come with humility, but we got to come with some praise in our hearts.